Hello and welcome to the home of St. Patrick in the city of Armagh. We're here in the magnificent setting of St. Patrick's Cathedral in honour of our patron saint. We've got music, words, dance, ancient, modern, secular and sacred. So join us as we celebrate. My name is Patrick. I am a sinner, a simple country person, and the least of all believers. I am looked down upon by many. I was taken into captivity in Ireland, along with thousands of others. We deserved this because we had gone away from God and did not keep his commandments.
Before he died, St. Patrick recorded the details of his extraordinary life. Sixteen centuries later, we still recount the story of the kidnapped teenager forced to tend livestock around Slemish Mountain. But for now, we'll concentrate on his return to Ireland as a missionary a decade or two later. In the year 432 AD, it's believed that he came ashore somewhere near here, just outside Down Patrick, after travelling up the river from Strangford Lock. Unsurprisingly, this area is still renowned for its connections to the saint. John Killen has literally written a book about Patrick's life and work, and we're meeting in the townland of Saul. Well, John, this is Saul. How important is this area to the story of St. Patrick? I think this is crucial. Saul is its a little gem lost in the Drumlin Hills of County Down, but it contains basically the cradle of Christianity in Ireland. This is where Patrick landed when he started his mission to convert the Irish to Christianity. This is where Deku gave him his barn for the first church. This is where Patrick celebrated his first mass. It's reputed this is where he wrote the confession, his confessio, and this is where he died. John, irrespective of people's personal religious beliefs, I presume everybody must accept that he was an extraordinary character. Well, I think you know, when you look at it from the human perspective, he must have been a, a, an amazing character. He must have had great courage to come to the outer extremities of the world, which was what Ireland was in the fifth century, to go back into uh, a social setup that he knew was unforgiving, to basically flout the existing religion to put forward his, his position, took great courage but also great acumen, and he must have known how to deal with people and how to deal with hierarchies, but also the lowest people in, in the hierarchy. Patrick's character would benefit from another three academic books, but I'm not going to write them.
It goes without saying that a town with Patrick in its very name is closely connected to our patron saint. This is Downpatrick, a thriving, busy market town, but reminders of its ancient history are never far away. Well, John, this is the magnificent Down Cathedral, and this, we believe, is the grave of St. Patrick. So in this area, you have both his landing place and his final resting place. Yep. You could almost say that we have, in this area, cornered the market on St. Patrick. We have not just his landing place, we have Saul Church, which was Deku's barn that he gave to Patrick to celebrate his first mass. We have the altar stone on which Patrick did celebrate his first mass. We have Sleeve Patrick, which was uh, begun in 1932 in the 1500th anniversary of Patrick's mission. We have Struel Wells, which is within walking distance of Saul, in which Patrick 
is reputed to have lain at night in the waters reciting the Psalms. And he was doing this because he was investing time in taking into Christianity some of the very important pagan sites that, um, that needed to be taken over. So really, we have a multiplicity of sites within this area. So much here, but he didn't exactly leave out the rest of Ireland no. either, did he? No, no. Every townland in Ireland has got a St. Patrick's story or a connection. There are over 3,000 holy wells in Ireland. The majority of them are attributed to St. Patrick. We have Loch Derg in Donegal. We have Croke Patrick in Mayo. We have the Hill of Tara, where Patrick um, combated with the, the Druids of King Lear and by winning was allowed to bring Christianity into Ireland. We have the Hill of Slain, where he lit the Paschal fire. All these have real and intimate connections with our patron saint. So everywhere else in Ireland has its claim, John, but if you're asking us, if it's Patrick you're into, you'd have to come to Armagh and Down. You must come to Armagh and Down, and though it pains me to say it, we must go to Antrim too, because Slemish is very much a part of the story. John, thank you very much. No, thank you, it's been a pleasure.
The Book of Armagh was written early in the 9th century. It contains the earliest surviving record of the life of St. Patrick, drawn in part from his own writings, including his confession. Historical details of his life are scarce, but the myths and the legends associated with them certainly are not. Snakes and shamrocks, miracles and magic, surely no other patron saint has inspired such a wealth of stories and symbols. And here in Armagh, these myths are woven into the very shape of the city itself. Well, Roddy, tell me this great story about St. Patrick and the Fawn and, and how it relates specifically to Armagh. OK, Patrick arrived in the area that we would know today as Armagh as an evangelist trying to convert the Irish to Christianity. Um, one of the main obstacles that you would have found in, in those times was the fact that this area was governed by a series of local chieftains. But the most important of these was Dara. And after some toing and froing, Dara eventually relented and acceded to Patrick's request to build his great stone church on the site presumably where Dara himself was living. But when Patrick and his entourage arrived on that site, they found a deer and her fawn grazing there. And some of Patrick's followers were resolved to capture the, this little fawn and maybe have a banquet in celebration, but Patrick intervened and he lifted the deer, put it on his shoulders and carried it across from the site of where the Anglican Cathedral stands today over to the site where the Catholic Cathedral stands. Thus giving two very important locations within the modern city of Armagh which are directly related to the saint. There are so many different myths and legends about St. Patrick, aren't there? There are. There are as many myths, I suppose, as there are locations who lay claim to the saint. And you know, there's, there's speculation that he may have founded a church for every day in the year. But nevertheless, most of these stories are important locally because they begin to explain perhaps a place name or a site. But most of them have very, very little basis in historical fact. Um, like even something like the Shamrock, it's very difficult to ascertain relevance in any written piece of historiography that details the story of the Shamrock. Similarly, the snakes, the snakes don't appear until the 11th century, and even then, not in Ireland, but in England. Well, whatever the basis of these stories, we can still enjoy them, Roddy, thank you. We can indeed. I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity, by invocation of the same, the three in one, and one in three. I bind this day to me forever, 
by power of faith, Christ's incarnation, his baptism in the Jordan River, his death on cross for my salvation, his bursting from the spiced tomb, his riding up the heavenly way, his coming at the day of doom, I bind unto myself today.
This hill, Ard Maha, gave Armagh its name. It's believed to be the site of the oldest settlement in the city. It's also believed to be the site where St. Patrick built his very first stone church. As one of the oldest cities in Ireland, Armagh has many great historical claims and connections. Tour guide Donna Fox can tell us more, including why Patrick picked it as his headquarters. He knew that the royalty of Ulster lived just on the outskirts of Armagh and if he could convert the king and queen, then he was in a good place to convert the rest of the population. And interestingly, St Patrick is not the only Irish legend associated with this very site. A stone's throw from where we're sitting, there's a plaque dedicated to the memory of Brian Boru, Ireland's first and most famous Thai king, slain at the Battle of Clontarf. He had visited Armagh about 10 years beforehand and placed 20 ounces of gold on the altar in this cathedral, asking that when he died, his remains would be brought to Armagh. There's a beautiful sculpture which has been there since 2014. It's the head of Brian Boru because at the Battle of Clontarf he was decapitated by a Viking raider. There are numerous other historical attractions in this city, from the Georgian Mall to the stunning Robinson Library, which houses Jonathan Swift's own copy of his masterpiece, Gulliver's Travels. But it's the internationally renowned St. Patrick who is the big draw. He really is an international figure and not a lot of people know that he's also the patron saint of Nigeria, the patron saint of French fishermen and the patron saint of engineers. So he's known, he, he's a phenomenon worldwide. It's, it's so well known on an international scale. Having said that, if you want to have that really strong connection, you've got to come here. Arma is definitely the place to be on St Patrick's Day.
Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in the hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. <laughs>